If you're big into hiking, you've probably stepped on a venomous snake. Maybe I should explain. This is Professor Graham Alexander. I'm a professor of herpetology. A professional herpetologist. Basically, the fancy and nerdy term for a guy who loves, loves reptiles and studies them. Oh, did I mention he loves them? Well, anyway, here's what he said when I asked him, what happens if you accidentally stand on a puff adder? So, puff adders, in, in fact, in a lot of the books, they record them as being fat, lazy snakes, and if you tread on them, they're going to bite you. And under some circumstances, they'll do that, but not all. Thank you, Professor. That's all I needed to hear now to try and test this out in my herb studio. <sighs> what am I going to do? If the snake feels that it's camouflaged, if it's got something to go under, and you get let the snake calm down and feel at home, I think that if you put a foot on it, nothing will happen. The snake won't react. Let's put that to the test with my captive puff adders over here. But first, we need to become a scientist and build a slice of nature or the wild in my herb studio. For that, you will need some wood that you cut up and maybe a little bit of skill to put it together and make a little box. And dirt. This stuff right here. Rocks, wood, sticks, leaves, maybe some grass, and boo! Nature. And now to take out the snake to put it in the little set that we have created. We are starting with a puff adder. So this is the male he has recently eaten, which means this study might not go so well because he might not be in his ambush mode. If a puff adder is in a hidden position, it would really be stupid from the puff adder's point of view to advertise where it is. So now, if you happen to be walking in the bush and you come across a puff adder that is moving, you will get a very different reaction because in a situation like that, the puff adder is now in an exposed position and from its perspective, it's thinking, oh, I'm visible. Now I need to defend myself. And in a situation like that, a puff adder will hiss and if you really get close to it, it might strike at you. Now never tell a puff adder like this. Let's add him into his new home and give him about 48 hours, maybe less, to rest and find his whereabouts. And then we're going to, guess what? Step on the puff adder and see if he strikes. And I guess it's time to do the test, but I don't really want to put my foot on the puff adder itself because I'm not that dumb. So what I've done is I've gotten my arch nemesis to reluctantly donate his foot over here. He didn't want to donate his whole leg so I had to make like this kind of jib so we can use it. But I don't think he's going to miss this foot because it's kind of ugly. It looks like a clown mixed with a mannequin. So he shouldn't, he should be fine. Although he is kind of out in the open and basking at the moment. So I think we might get a bit of a different response with this particular puff adder. So let's get it ready. I'm going to stand on the snake um, on his head. Oh wow, he's moving there. Let's see what happens. Even though the snake knows it's exposed, let's go. And first reaction, snake wants to try get away. How amazing is that? So as you could see down there, as I stand on the snake here, it's just wanting to escape, not bite whatsoever, going over my iPhone there. And that's what it is. So that goes to show, even if the snake is kind of out in an open position, its first priority is to try and get away from you and not to bite you. So yes, it, it has a higher likelihood of biting you if it's not in an ambush position, giving its position away. But if it is out open and exposed, it still doesn't want to bite you as a first response. But as the first line of defense, sit tight is what the puff adders do. So there we go. Bryce tailing a puff adder, which is not something that should be done. These guys have incredible scales, incredible sense of smell, scent, and they are super intelligent, way more intelligent than people think. And look at his peachy little cheeks. Here we have my big female puff adder. So we're gonna put her in the set and give her also some time to relax and hopefully she responds differently. And then as soon as we put the foot on her, she is not going to react in the same fleeing motion, but hopefully just staying still and chilled. The big girl's been in the set for over 48 hours now. So we're gonna test and put the foot on her. Remember that ugly clown foot? And you may be asking yourself, 
price. How do you know if a puff adder is going to or is not going to bite you? Well, in short, you don't. And if you see it, it's probably going to bite you. So don't be stupid and go testing your hand or putting your foot on a puff adder because Bryce says, oh, a puff adder is not going to bite. And now for the test, we're going to step right on top of this puff adder and see what happens. I hope she's going to cooperate. Look there, standing on her, nothing. She's not even moving or responding. A little bit of a tongue flick there. And that's it. We'll stand once again, boom. And I'm putting quite a bit of pressure and she is not reacting whatsoever. There we go. How incredible is that? That shows you right there that these snakes do not want to bite you. And why is that? Well, because if she displays herself and she, well, she basically knows you are way more of a threat than if she just hides away. She doesn't want to bite you because she is going to lose in a fight if she tries to bite you or whatever. So her best option to stay alive is to rely on her crypsis and stay hidden and do not give herself away no matter the circumstances. And they are so intelligent they can actually f differentiate the difference between different animals, different species, even different species of toad from sight alone. So don't call puff adders stupid because they are not stupid. They probably know more about different toad and frog species than you are because they know what is not toxic and what is toxic and what they should avoid. So that's quite interesting. So don't call them stupid if they know more than you. So they are able to identify the difference between toads and rodents, for example, but even different types of rodents. <laughs> And if you still don't believe me, here's a porcupine walking over a puff adder in the wild. And if that's still not enough for you, or you just want to learn a bit more, I've linked a few scientific papers below the like button. Okie dokie, I have a rat over here and we're going to now see the difference between obviously the prop foot that we use to stand on her, which she knows is not food, versus a rodent which is food because obviously they lie in the same position for a very long period of time waiting for food and differentiating what is food versus a predator or not food per se. So let's get the rat out and see her response. It's going to be juicy. It's going to drip all over the floor. So if you are grossed out about this, stop watching. So here we have the nice big juicy rat and I'm going to put it in, kind of act like, like it's a, it's a rodent moving around. Let's see what she does. Ooh. Boom, did you see that? She knows exactly what that is. She knows, okay, that's a rodent. We are going to eat it straight away. And she knew that wasn't a fake foot that we're putting on there. She didn't even have to tongue flick if you noticed there. So visually they can differentiate between different prey items as well as different objects that are possibly harmful and possibly edible. An interesting fact that you see now with the puff adder is, is look, she dropped the rat straight away. That is because rats bite and that can harm her. So in the wild, puff adders are known for holding on to birds like pheasants and that so it doesn't fly away. So then they'll hold on. But with a rodent, it has been documented and well documented that they'll actually let go of the rodent once they have bitten it and then kind of follow the scent trail and go and eat it. While in captivity, most of the time, they will bite on and hold onto the rodent because generally the rodent is a dead prey item. So they are able to identify the difference between toads and rodents, for example, but even different types of rodents. And for example, where we've recorded them preying on birds or arboreal lizards, when they strike, they will always hang on to that bird or that lizard, something like a triagama, okay? If they release it like they often release a rat, the bird will fly away before it dies and the agama will run up the tree. And so the snake is behaving in a way that's particular to that prey type. So I would say it's not just telling the difference between prey and predator, it's far more refined than that. 
we don't give them enough credit. But that doesn't take necessarily intellect. It's that they certainly have the brain power to distinguish the different visual images of what's coming past. And you must understand that if a puffhead is in an ambush position, it's got to make a split-second decision. Do I strike at this thing or not? And if you'd like access to the full-length conversation I had with Professor Graham Alexander, close to an hour of great information that you will not find here, head over to Patreon, linked right below the like button. And if you learned something new, consider liking and subscribing.